Hi, I'm Anne from 21 Readers. Today I'm giving one sentence reviews to the 111 books I read this year. I'm going to be going genre by genre, and in each genre I'm going to go chronologically in the order that I read them. I'll have timestamps in the description to skip around, and the genres in this video are going to be thriller, romance, literary fiction, contemporary fiction, horror, science fiction slash fantasy, historical fiction, young adult, and non-fiction. I hope you have a safe New Year's and you got to relax a little bit in the week between Christmas and New Year's. I had a few highlights for me over my time off. One was finally unpacking my books from when I moved, so I have books in the background of the video finally. I don't have much furniture or storage in this new place, so I'm still figuring out what I'm gonna do with these books. I also saw my final Broadway show of 2023 over this break I saw Merrily We Roll Along with Jonathan Groff and Daniel Radcliffe and I'm anticipating lots of Tonys for that show in 2024. I had fun prepping this video to show you my year in review basically in a one sentence format and I will say for this video when I was working on it I think because I was so focused on reading what I had prepped for the sentences I have like a very serious face as if like somebody is forcing me into a corner and reading them off the screen. Which is why I'm actually redoing the intro because the first intro was very, hello, are you okay? Like blink twice if you need help. So this is me redoing the intro. So it's a little bit more peppy. Here's the one sentence reviews, serious edition, 111 books. I hope you enjoy it and take care. The Ingenue by Rachel Kapelke Dale, a suspense book I should have DNF'd. Just the Nicest Couple by Mary Kubica, thriller I was engaged by the whole time. What Lies in the Woods by Kate Alice Marshall, thriller where everything was connected. The Villa by Rachel Hawkins, thriller with so much wasted potential. The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz, thriller that irritated me from cover to cover. The Only Survivors by Megan Miranda, thriller at the Outer Banks with fun twists and a friend group you can't trust. The Last Word by Taylor Adams, Thriller with a bunch of action chase scenes, but I couldn't tell you much about the characters. The Only One Left by Riley Sager, my favorite thriller of the year. I had fun with this one. She Started It by Sean Gilbert, the most insufferable thriller I read this year. The Spare Room by Andrea Bartz, thriller that frustrated me. Girls on Their Horses by Eliza Jane Brazier, thriller that felt original and like nothing I've ever read before. You Can Trust Me by Wendy Hurd, thriller with a fun island setting. A Twisted Love Story by Samantha Downing, thriller that was one of my most unpleasant reading experiences this year. Everyone Here is Lying by Sherry Lapina, thriller with neighborhood drama that you can read in a day. Play the Fool by Lena Churn, thriller where my dislike for the main character grew after each chapter. Just Another Missing Person by Jillian McAllister, thriller that lost momentum in the second half. None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell, thriller with a fun podcast element. Good Bad Girl by Alice Feeney, thriller that made me question why I still read thrillers. Bored to Death by C.J. Connor, cozy mystery that had me bored to death. The Mystery Guest by Nita Prose, thriller sequel that I read to see if the author improved the neurodivergent rep from The Maid, and she did, but barely. The Maid by Nita Prose, mystery I reread so that I could make a video about the neurodivergent rep, and maybe me saying this will motivate me to finally make that video. No One Can Know by Kate Alice Marshall, thriller with sister drama where you can't trust anyone, but it was still an average book. Those are the thrillers. Next we have Romance. Sorry Bro by Talene Viscani. This was a romance that felt like a contemporary with strong Armenian rep. Behind the Scenes by Karelia Stets Waters. A forgettable romance with a character who did ASMR as a hobby. For Her Consideration by Amy Spaulding. A romance that went on for way too long and it didn't make sense that the characters ended up together. Just As You Are by Camille Kellogg. My favorite grumpy sunshine romance of the year and it's the debut. An Island Princess Starts a Scandal by Adriana Herrera, my very first historical romance book I've ever read, and it features lesbians in Paris. The Fiancé Farce by Alexandria Belfleur, romance book that made me question if I'm ever going to read from this author again. Cleek Cute by Meryl Wilsner, this is my favorite romance of the year because the characters worked on self-improvement in addition to their relationship. In the Case of Heartbreak by Courtney Kay, a male-male romance that should have been a fun summer rom-com but was a slug to finish. Love at First Set by Jennifer Dugan, a romance where I was more invested in the family drama going on than in the relationship. Stars in Your Eyes by Case and Callender, a romance with heavy themes that could have worked better as literary fiction. Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, a romance I reread for the movie. Ten Things That Never Happened by Alexis Hall, a romance with strong potential but its execution made me want it to end sooner than it did. Fly With Me by Andy Burke, a debut romance with an amazing first chapter. 
Second Chances in Newport Stephen by TJ Alexander, a romance that felt like it was doing something new with older characters in their 40s. Late Bloomer by Maisie Eddings, a romance with neurodivergent characters that felt authentic. Wild Things by Laura Kay, a romance that should have been a contemporary fiction and it didn't make sense that the characters ended up together. How You Get the Girl by Anita Kelly, a sapphic romance between a high school basketball coach and a foster parent with emphasis on mental health. Kiss Her Once For Me by Alison Cochran, a reread I did around the holiday season that I probably won't read again next holiday season. Those were my romances, these are my literary fictions. We Do What We Do in the Dark by Michelle Hart, a book that reminded me why I love literary fiction. Mame by Jessica George, my favorite debut book of the year and in my top three reads of the year. I Had Some Questions for You by Rebecca Mackay, literary fiction with a captivating mystery. Small Joys by Elvin James Mensa, literary fiction slice of life story with a focus on mental health and being in your early 20s. Mad Honey by Jodi Pico, literary fiction that was this author's best book in a while. The Late American by Brandon Taylor, literary fiction, one of my most disappointing reads of the year since it was average and I usually give this author five stars. Happiness Falls by Angie Kim, this is my favorite book of the year and it features a mystery at the center, family drama, and disability rep. Family Meal by Brian Washington, literary fiction with a beautiful exploration of grief. Those were my literary fictions, now these are my contemporary fictions. Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson, contemporary fiction about rich women in NYC complaining. Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt, contemporary fiction about an old woman that will make you laugh when you're supposed to be crying. The Bennett Woman by Eden Apaya Kubi, a book that says it's a Pride and Prejudice retelling but was one of the most forgettable books I read this year. A Likely Story by Lee McMullen Abrahamson, contemporary fiction about rich people in NYC complaining but this time it feels like I read it before. The Whispers by Ashley Aldrain, contemporary fiction with lots of neighborhood suspense and drama. Yellowface by R.F. Kwong, contemporary fiction that had me hooked the whole time. Family Lore by Elizabeth Acevedo, disappointing contemporary fiction that had too many POVs. The Verifiers by Jane Peck, contemporary fiction with the main character I did not care about. Those are my contemporary fiction, moving on to horror. The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay, horror that I reread to prep for the movie. How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix, horror with creepy puppet scenes. Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit, most disturbing horror book I've ever read. Seriously, check trigger warnings, but it's still an important read highlighting horrors that trans people face. My Darling Girl by Jennifer McMahon, horror that read like a family drama. Starling House by Alex E. Harrow, horror that I wanted to love but frustrated me. Rouge by Mona Awad, horror about the skincare and beauty industry that confused me and went on forever. Those were my horrors, now moving into science fiction slash fantasy. Small Way to an Angry Planet by Becky Chambers, sci-fi that was way too long but I'm glad I tried this author. In the Lives of Puppets by TJ Klune, the most disappointing book I had all year because of my high expectations from this author. A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers, science fiction that was more for the futuristic existential vibes than the plot. Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry, it's fantasy that was supposed to be cozy and fun but it wasn't really my thing. The Rise of Kiyoshi by F.C. Yi, a fantasy book that meant nothing to me because I've never seen Avatar The Last Airbender. Those are my science fiction fantasy, moving into my historical fiction. Hang the Moon by Jeanette Walls, my worst book of the year and reminds me why I don't like historical fiction. The Spectacular by Fiona Davis, historical fiction book that delivered on its NYC vibes and there was a mystery too. Lavender House by Lev A.C. Rosen, a historical mystery with the fun premise that lost steam. Now moving into all my young adult books that I read this year. Blame for the Win by Robbie Couch, the first book I read this year. I liked it but it's not my favorite from this author. This is Why They Hate Us by Aaron H. Aceves, a YA book that features mental health. Kiss and Tell by Adib Karam. This is a boy band YA book, but I reread this year and I liked it less after the reread. A Million to One by Adiba Jagardar, a YA book I should have loved but didn't. Self Made Boys by Anna Marie McLemore, a YA retelling of The Great Gatsby that I still think about. Promise Boys by Nick Brooks, a YA thriller that was a debut and I'll definitely read more from this author. Killjoy by Holly Jackson, a YA thriller novella that you can read in an afternoon. Always the Almost by Edward Underhill, a YA book with trans joy and also features a piano competition. Missing Clarissa by Ripley Jones, a YA thriller with a podcast element featuring two main characters who have no idea what they're doing but it was still a fun time. The Agathas by Kathleen Glasgow and Liz Lawson, YA thriller that was fine but I won't be continuing in the series. My Dear Henry by Kaylin Barron, a YA Jekyll and Hyde retelling that I was surprisingly emotional invested in. Time Out by Sean Hayes, Todd Milliner, and Carlin Greenwald, a YA book that tried to do too much and felt like a first draft. Afterglow by Phil Stamper, YA book with my favorite friend group. 
Fake Dates and Mooncakes by Cher Lee, a YA book that looks cute but the execution was rough. Cool for the Summer by Dahlia Adler, a book that reminds me why sometimes I don't like reading YA. This Delicious Death by Kayla Cottingham, a YA horror book that takes place at a summer music festival and has queer rep. The Luis Ortega Survival Club, a YA book that had important commentary but it felt like reading a middle grade. You're Not Supposed to Die Tonight by Kaylin Bayron, a YA thriller that will be my new summer camp book recommendation. Girls Like Girls by Hailey Kiyoko, a YA book set in 2006 that felt like a story I've read before. If I See You Again Tomorrow by Robbie Couch, a YA book that is my favorite time loop book I've ever read. Your Lonely Nights Are Over by Adam Sass, YA horror that had me invested and had a fun fall small town setting. Fraternity by Andy Mentis, a YA historical fiction at a boarding school but also has fantasy and horror elements. The Wicked Unseen by Gigi Griffiths, a YA thriller about cults that never really went anywhere. Give Me a Sign by Anna Sortino, a YA summer camp book with great deaf representation. The 99 Boyfriends of Micah Summers by Adam Sass, YA book that was average but I wanted to check out this author's backlist. Onder and Santi Were Here by Johnny Garzavia, a YA book that made me cry at the end. Teach the Torches to Burn by Caleb Rorig a YA Romeo and Juliet retelling but make it queer, Wicked Little Things by Justin Arnold, a YA horror I should have DNF'd, Only This Beautiful Moment by Abdi Nazemian, my favorite YA book I've read this year, plus it made me cry, plus it reminds me why historical fiction can be so powerful. I read two middle grades this year, Pet by Akweke Meze, a middle grade with important symbolism that was a little bit confusing, and Eli Over Easy by Phil Stamper, a middle grade about processing grief featuring queer rep. Those are my young adult and middle grade. Next, we have my nonfiction, You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People by Aubrey Gordon, nonfiction book with comprehensive information and a great extension of the author's podcast, Oscar Wars by Michael Shulman, my favorite nonfiction book I read this year, mostly because it's about one of my favorite topics, Quietly Hostile by Samantha Irby, nonfiction comedy book with essays about the pandemic and TV writing, Page Boy by Elliot Page, memoir that was jarring to read but so glad I read it, The 2000s Made Me Gay by Grace Perry, a nonfiction book that felt dated and could use some updated pop culture references, MCU The Reign of Marvel Studios by Joanna Robinson, Del Gonzalez, and Gavin Edwards, nonfiction book with lots of information about Marvel if you like those films or if you like hearing about Hollywood drama, The Woman and Me by Britney Spears, a memoir that could have been longer and more detailed but still powerful, Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond, nonfiction with lots of research about who's at fault for poverty in America and what we can all do to help. And finally, my last book I read in 2023 is Wolf Song by TJ Klune, a fantasy romance I finally read and I think I would have liked it better if it was 150 pages shorter. Those were the one sentence reviews of the 111 books I read in 2023. Tell me in the comments if you've read any of these books and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.